I've long talked about mech and strategy titles with their power fantasy itch and content richness that makes them so fun to play. Hence, when I combined the two, thought faster back in 1998 with Mech Commander, utilizing the Battletech universe and MechWare game series in one package. Unfortunately, like seemingly every good mech title from the 90s, it's unsupported by any online distributor. Fortunately, this isn't as big of an issue thanks to the 1999 Gold version being made freeware and a dedicated fanbase that has kept updating and modding it for modern OS's. For good reason too, because Mech Commander delivers an experience that just hasn't been replicated, apart from its sequel and Brigador. Even then, the latter is more mech action than strategy. Does that make it easy to set up and run? Uh, sort of. Originally I wanted to play the 98 version. However, the lack of online downloads led me to purchasing a big box copy, a damn fine package. However, it starts up, but the resolution is stuck at a hopeless 800 by 600 and the impossibly fast camera was unfixable. This just might be my Windows system, I don't know, leaving me to play the gold version, containing the unaltered campaign and expansion pack, Desperate Measures. You're able to change the resolution somewhat in the config INI file, although this leads to one of Mech Commander's greatest compatibility problems. The default resolutions are quite low in terms of screen real estate, and it keeps hitching when scrolling as if tied to the mech's movement, making the whole commanding aspect painfully hard. Luckily, there are fan packs that force a higher value, except the menus and UI don't scale and it constantly crash when forcing 16x9 aspect ratios. After fucking around for several hours, I settled on the 1280x720 option. Not too blurry, no ruin the UI, and stable enough I didn't have an aneurysm. In the two missions that it faulted, going down to the second default option solved this. It indicates that despite fan efforts, a proper remaster would be appreciated. After all that bullshit, you'd wonder if it's even worth the hassle, and happily it is. The campaign takes place during Operation Bulldog, the first offensive by the newly reformed Second Star League, a confederation of hundreds of planets from the various great Inner Sphere houses aiming to knock out Clan Smoke Jaguar, one of the toughest, most militant clans. I think the Battletech lore is severely underrated. Its cast of characters, scope of conflicts, and night endless series of plots is only comparable to Star Trek, Star Wars, or 40k in terms of epic sci-fi settings. The greatest difference from those franchises is that Battletech has a conclusion of sorts. The clan invasion of the Inner Sphere, the greatest of storylines starting 30 years ago, got an actual, well-received ending. I assume so, I only read the first book from the Twilight of the Clan saga. It was pretty good. Despite this richness, Mech Commander just covers a sliver of the conflict. You're an unnamed commander of Zulu Company, under the Davian's guards as part of the initial strike force to liberate the planet of Port Arthur. There's no major characters, except your CEO Colonel Reese and the mech warriors that have different portraits, brief synopsis, and voice lines. You're merely a small element of a much larger storyline, in line with most Battletech related games. Of course, this doesn't matter unless you're like me and enjoy background lore adding an extra layer of context to the gameplay. Across 36 missions and 6 operations, you lead and gradually grow your company as the stages increase in complexity and difficulty. Initially it's taking out clan patrols and outposts, harassing their communications and logistics, later you're capturing industrial zones, backing up resistance forces and liberating cities, finally culminating in wiping out orbital batteries and the best of the Jaguar's warrior cast in some grueling battles. Although there's no objective markers, it's easy to understand what you have to do as the maps are pretty linear except for the occasional outpost or resource dump. Mech Commander was actually an early pioneer of the real-time tactics subgenre, removing base building mechanics and just focusing on managing units. It's a welcomed evolution, making the gameplay simple to learn. The campaign progression feels appropriately methodical, detailing the ongoing tactical and strategic challenges that confront a planetary invasion. The mission briefings are the most story you get outside the opening and ending FMVs. Your commander will give an update between operations with text outlining the mission tasks themselves. There's also an overview map and deployment zones. Strangely, despite all the level details displayed prior, in-game it's covered by fog of war. Inversely, and unlike nearly every strategy game, once you reveal the area, it stays revealed, helping to detect enemies and avoid rear attacks. Depending on mission, you can deploy a maximum of 12 units split across 3 lances. A lance being made up of 4 mechs and supporting vehicles limited only by the deployment weight cap. The weight of each unit is listed underneath and affixed to the mech's chassis themselves, unaffected by munitions or armor value. This is one of the best and worst mechanics in Mech Commander, as the tight weight cap forces you to carefully consider and adjust your loadout in each mission, 
instead of dominating every engagement with assault mechs or using haphazard assortments. You must play and fail the missions multiple times before realising the optimal loadout. There's no mid-mission saving or time dilation, but the frequent trial and error is tempered by mission brevity of maybe 10 minutes. The devs did a great job tapping into Battletech's wide enemy roster, resorting in a solid variety of unit types across the campaign. Initial contact features unarmored vehicles, infantry, and a handful of light mechs. Soon, you'll confront artillery batteries, mobile airstrike platforms backed up by a mixture of medium mech lancers, before the endgame of just heavy tanks, MLRSs, and whole stars of assault mechs that will just break unprepared formations. There's even the occasional appearance of infantry and omni mechs hidden amongst the foliage that will ruin a few playthroughs. It feels appropriately unfair being ambushed by a cadre of elite clan mech warriors, making the satisfaction of surviving such a gauntlet with your raggedy team absolutely palpable. Regarding controlling the mechs themselves, you better have read the manual or at least familiar with strategy games as there's no tutorial. You're just given a couple simple starting missions plus a few difficulty tiers. Thankfully, moving mechs around is as easy as clicking on them and pointing where they go. You can adjust their speed from walking to running and their engagement distances, affecting how they use weapons. Combat requires clicking on an enemy and letting a pilot maneuver around them and automatically fire. The AI is careful to not expose their weaker backsides and are usually responsive. You'll rarely see units milling around, making defensive tasking reliable, except when defending a critical building. Mech warrior pilots themselves are relegated from the story, yet still important as their quality determines how well your mech performs in combat. Initially, you're stuck with green and regular pilots that are useless beyond simple light mechs and can barely hit anything. But over time, they rank up and become capable of slightly better accuracy and not suffer performance penalties when piloting heavier chassis. If your mech is destroyed, your pilot ejects, but they'll be injured, requiring recovery time. Or they'll die outright if their health, confusingly represented in these red bars, runs out. It's well worth ejecting pilots manually when they're at risk or just restarting a level if you lose a good one. As while most are purchasable, veteran and elite mech warriors can take the entire campaign to level up and are essential to pass the last stretch of missions. Besides your own mechs, you can also pick support vehicles. These ancillaries perform actions like recon, mine laying, and repairs. Mine laying's usability is very defensive, but fun thanks to unlimited mines allowing you to cover every approach and watch columns of clanners get stunned and destroyed. Repair trucks are easily the most useful unit in the game as they can maintain your entire force indefinitely, while the clan mechs don't have this luxury. You can pull off very aggressive tactics before retreating and refitting, or maneuver them in combat to repair and fight simultaneously. It seems the devs were somewhat aware of this, as there's a limited number of them, so they're not always available and can be saved for harder missions. Mech Commander also offers off-map support options in airstrikes and reconnaissance. It's a very efficient implementation of air power, reducing unit clutter, and requires careful precision to maximize the destructiveness. They have annoyingly lengthy delay time, but it goes both ways for the enemy, enabling you to avoid their barrages. Buildings and mech commander's maps don't just serve as nice window dressing or strong points, but also as capturable facilities. These are gate and missile control towers, radars, and repair stations. Seizing them intact can make a massive difference in locating targets to airstrike, refitting a team, and flipping enemy defenses. Jump jets come in handy here, as they allow mechs to leap over walls and impassable terrain. They act as great scout mechs, and more than a few times, I use them to seize a base intact and bog down an enemy counterattack. Alternatively, you can save the citizenry from their homes with a barrage of high explosive rounds. You can set forest fires and clear a route, and target oil refineries to take out a clan patrol with massive collateral on the side. Again, the devs seem aware of this, sending batches of reinforcements conspicuously close to some gas silos. For 1998, it's a pretty good looking RTS. The early 3D modeling gives everything a sort of 2.5D veneer that holds up thanks to ample details, color, sound, and particle effects. Explosions and fires are always satisfying and seeing mechs get torn apart with their arms flying off is impressive. The aftermath of a firefight is choked full of mechs, blown out vehicles, and scorch marks that emphasize the devastation of these war machines, not dissimilar to the usual mech warrior battle. There's a fitting playlist of background music that's too short and repetitive to last this video's length, leave it to MechWarrior 2 score to come in clutch. MechWarrior games are as famous for their mechs as they are for their customization, and extrapolation of the tabletop rules would have become something of a genre mainstay. 
but as a couple dozen mechs available, with franchise classics such as Catapults, Ravens and Atlases, and much rarer clan favourites like the Ula and Mad Cat on show. Mech Commander simplifies things a lot. Each mech has three variants, for more weapons, better armour, or jump jets. You can't adjust the weight or location of weapon and armour values, and besides weapons, the radar is the only other adjustable piece of equipment. Focusing on just allotting weapons is a good thing in my opinion, you should be more focused on balancing out your team. The weapons themselves are divided between energy, missiles and ballistics, like lasers, heavy autocannons, SRMs and LRMs, PPCs and gauss cannons. These are categorised in short, medium and long range tiers, so you can create a team of close range brawlers, mobile artillery platforms, fast moving skirmishers and lumbering death dealing behemoths. Strangely, there's no heat system, seemingly just unimplemented due to lack of dev time. This has the problematic result of making energy weapons objectively the best, although I rarely ran out of conventional ammo. I don't think the UI is that good in sorting through your mechs. A simple unequip everything option would have been better than individually deselecting each unit and some help icons explaining different features are absent. Mech Commander's appeal and longevity is greatly bolstered by implementing a simple economy and salvage system, pulled right from Mech 2 Mercs. While you do earn money, credit points in this case, for completing objectives successfully and can purchase a list of available Innisphere mechs and weapons between missions, the real reward is in capturing enemy supplies and stripping down fallen mechs. This is very cool in how fun it is finding hidden depots of better gear and that this is the only way to access superior clan variant weapons and mechs. Actually disabling enemy mechs without destroying them seems like luck of the draw unless you target specific parts using the number pad, such as the legs or cockpit. This is a good inclusion, made redundant, as your pilots are just terribly inaccurate and won't hit anything. A lance pack with clan variant PPCs or pulse lasers can obliterate any mech in a single volley, and just several mad cats in your crew becomes a power trip. At the same time, selling spare equipment and mechs helps you break even on repair costs, which can handicap your loadout if ignored. These various systems and mechanics really do make Mech Commander an engaging time, albeit there's a few significant problems that hamper it. For one, it certainly feels its age with how short the engagement distances are. Elevated terrain can reveal a lot of the surroundings, especially when equipped with advanced sensors, except aside from deploying airstrikes, there's little else, making the very map topography quite flat. There's a fairly in-depth waypoint system, allowing you to direct your mechs around at different speeds and perform actions. The problem is that the controls for this are very cumbersome, and you can't rebind them in the menu, nor can you create basic formations before deployment. I found instead of slowly organising my forces, it was easy to micromanage units, sidestepping attacks and drawing enemies away from their bases. It only becomes problematic when you're spread across the map and must juggle multiple teams at once. Memorising enemy locations and mech types becomes a boring process of trial and error, but it was better than redoing unit grouping and pathing every time. Mech Commander's tactical elements would have greatly benefited if you could create groups larger than 4 and set waypoints on the briefing map rather than doing it all in mission. Perhaps a bigger issue with the campaign and level design is the objectives feeling very arbitrary. Instead of the maps and equipment becoming a proper sandbox of playstyles, it's more like a puzzle with only one solution. With this outlook, it explains why there's so many missions that feel very easy and short once you play them a couple times. The enemy AI is very scripted, not reactive like in similar RTSs. Alternatively, the frequent bouts of escort missions or having to kill escaping enemies funnels you down specific routes to not fail. The expansion pack bundled in the gold release contains the Desperate Measures campaign featuring more missions, more mechs, and more resolution problems. And that's fine, because in spite of its age, the core appeal of Mech Commander is still strong. I can't not recommend Mech Commander. For one, it's free, it works most of the time, and there's little else like it near 25 years later. It's unlikely the brief rekindling of the IP will spur anything from Microsoft, or whoever actually owns it, residing me to play Brigador and hope for a spiritual successor. If the ample custom campaigns on ModDB indicates anything, it's that there's a genuine passion for the game that hasn't been supplanted. In the meantime, Mech Commander remains a really nice game to raise a few neighbourhoods in the 31st century. Sir, we can't do that. Say adios.